Good day, brothers and sisters. It's Sunday once again. Another opportunity for us to worship and glorify the name of the living God. You know, one of the things that you and I understand is how vulnerable, how weak, how frail, how feeble you and I are. But thanks be to God because of the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit who lives and dwells in us. We are able to go through the trials, difficulties, adversities, and challenges of our lives. And we come out really victorious. And for that, we are to be thankful to God because our God sustains us. He preserves us. He provides the strength that we need for the day. In the same manner that God provided manna for the Israelites while they were in the wilderness, every single day, God provides the daily manna of grace in our lives. And so, friends, the important thing for us to realize is to continually abide in the Lord, depend on Him, uh, always trust Him for all things, and understand that apart from Him, we can do nothing. I'd like to share to you a verse which I hope will inspire you to depend on the Lord at all times. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the might of His strength. Friends, this is what we need, the might of the Lord, the strength of the Lord, the joy of the Lord. And so let us depend on Him. And as we depend on Him, we will be refreshed. We will be re-energized. And when that happens, friends, we should all the more glorify and worship God for His goodness in our lives. So I hope, friends, that with that exhortation, you're ready now to worship the Lord.
shall come to rescue me. What love, what grace that you gave me your only son, unworthy so. That you gave me your only son, unworthy, so unworthy, unworthy, so unworthy of your great love.
Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Great news everyone, we already have three weekend services. Every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. Good day, brothers and sisters. We are so blessed today because we are going to have a very, very special guest speaker in the person of Dr. Gary Hill. Dr. Gary Hill is the chief editor of Discovery Bible as well as the founder of it. And this was um, a uh, Bible that he and Dr. Gleason Archer worked on. Dr. Gleason Archer, as we very well know, is a linguist, he is well-known Bible scholar, and he was the one who mentored personally Dr. Gary Hill. And, and so this Discovery Bible is really the work of 27 years of labor of love. And that is why when you get hold of a Discovery Bible, you will be able to see the nuances of the Greek and Hebrew in a very friendly, user-friendly way. And for those of you who do not have a Discovery Bible, I'd like you to check it out, friends, and you may want to purchase one of those uh, apps which you can download into your laptop and be amazed, be amazed at the beauty of the Hebrew and the Greek. So without much ado, let me present to you Dr. Gary Hill. Hi, Gary Hill here, enjoying very much my stay in the Philippines from Chicago, Illinois. And I've been asked to speak on the subject of prayer. So important, huh? I'll begin with the fact that in the original Greek text, the word pray or prayer comes from two words. It means to interact with for wishes. Yes. 
actively interact for wishes. So prayer in Scripture is when we have a dialogue with God, not a monologue, and we interact with Him, interface actively, and we learn His wishes as He births them in our heart called faith. And if we want to grow in that school and art reality of prayer, wouldn't it be nice to know just how the Lord himself would say, this is how I want to interact with you. This is how I will let you know my wishes birthed in your heart, dropped in your heart. You'll know just what pleases me. If you've ever had a close relationship that you'd like even closer, I know you have. Well, here we have it with the living God. He's telling us in what we call the Lord's Prayer, could be called the Our Father, could be called the Disciples' Prayer. In Greek, it would call it the model or pattern prayer, the paradigm. But wouldn't it be grand if you knew just what someone wanted to hear and told you what pleased them. Wouldn't that be grand? And that is the meaning of the Lord's Prayer. So just before Matthew 6, 9 through 13, and we could call the Lord's Prayer the 10 affirmations God desires to hear from us. The top 10, if you will. Because in this context, they were praying in the wrong way, and then they said, teach us like John the Baptist's disciples pray. Would you give us the 12 apostles? Would you give us the insight on how you do it with the Father, just the right way to do it? And to our delight, he agreed to do it. And that is Matthew 6, 9 through 13, the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer that we all know by heart. And he corrected what was amiss what was still lacking in the way that John's disciples were doing it. And we get it right from God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, the eternal second person of the Holy Trinity. He, he told us the ten affirmations that please him. So, if we can nail this down and make it a regular part of our prayer life, this doesn't replace other things. It adds to it. It's a supplement in the prayer toolkit. So valuable. It's supposed to become a regular habit because the way the original Greek text runs, and you'll see it in verse 9, be praying, and remember that, inter that definition, be interacting in a dialogue with me, all the time talking, all the time talking with me, so that my wishes flow into your heart. My, that's grand. And these are the 10 ways to make that happen. So these 10 affirmations or the 10 yeses that God so wants to hear from us that would please him greatly and make us more conformed to his image. Just a little word at the beginning. A lot of us have backgrounds, liturgical backgrounds, where praying is to say prayers. This could sound a little revolutionary, but in Scripture, praying goes beyond saying prayers. It's interacting with God so his wishes become ours, birthed by faith. That's praying. So when Paul says pray without ceasing, he doesn't expect us always to get into a kneeling position. Nothing wrong with that. That's good. I kneel sometimes when I pray. But when we pray without ceasing, we're not just saying prayers. And we're not trying to find only a place to have a certain posture or a kneeling posture. It happens when we're walking, when we're talking, when we're communing with others in the body of Christ, when we're flowing in his presence and delighting in his light, when we're interacting and his wishes are being revealed in us, what pleases him. So would you like to know the 10 ways that that would happen best? The 10 yeses that God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, has asked for? It'll go beyond saying prayers because sometimes they have no words. They're just thoughts in the renewed mind. 
It isn't like the monastic side where you get all necessarily in a certain, certain posture like that. So here we go. We're going to move into the Lord's Prayer itself right now, realizing it's supposed to be a holy habit. The original text says, pray in this manner, in the way that I'm about to roll it out, in this regimen, in this way, following this paradigm, this model. So you have to understand at the beginning, though it's not wrong to rotely recite the Our Father, Though when Jesus gave it, it was originally intended to be something for sustained meditation that would guide us as the model paradigm thoughts so we don't always say the same things. We have the right diversification. We have the right yeses that please him. It's a holy habit, so you can fit it in. We'll be talking about more of that later. But it becomes part of our regular modus operandi, the way we go about things with praying. We're interacting with God in this dialogue. Now we're going to divide it up into 10 pieces. Others do it differently. You have 10 commandments on the Mount Sinai because 10 in the Bible stands for the total. And this conveniently can be studied in the 10 segments, but it doesn't have to be 10 only. Uh, it's not an artificial kind of distinction or a necessary one. But the first one that we're going to go with, and we'll end with... Um, deliver us from evil. Uh, number one's going to be our Father. You notice that in this description, this manner, this pattern of praying, this arrangement, as Pastor Mel brought out, doesn't begin with needs. It can be at certain times. It won't be legalistic. That can work, of course. But as a model, a pattern, a habit, a holy habit, we begin with Father. Our Father. I'd like to include Jeremiah 31 9 here because in Jeremiah 31 9, he talks about what it means to be a father to us. And he gives five elements. So these are just something to keep in mind on Jeremiah 31 9. First of all, he wants us to cry out to him as a father, let him know all that's going on, what we're valuing what we're struggling with, what we're working through, what we're hoping to grow in. And I just want to say by way of personal testimony that I was first challenged to pray through the Our Father as a model, a pattern for sustained prayer. Personal. Each of these points are personal. You're going to say, God, how do you want to be a father to me? The second one's going to be, Father, what does it mean when I, just like everybody else, Our Father, what was it going to mean when I hallow your name. These are stop ponder points to give the yes, to give the affirmation. And sometimes it'll take you five minutes, maybe take you sometimes a half hour, an hour. You just let the Holy Spirit work with you as you seek his face. But when I was 19 years old, Martin Lloyd-Jones from Westminster Chapel in London, in his book on Sermon on the Mount, mentioned that Martin Luther and others through the centuries have done this daily. Again, now, not legalistically, but regularly. It's a habit. And I started when I was 19 and have been doing it more or less every evening with great profit. It holds my life together. It's not my only part of prayer. There's intercession. There's all these things. But I've never found it boring or repetitious because it comes out nuanced and dimensioned differently every time. So what I'm about to do in sharing these thoughts and explaining it is not the only way to do it. It's not even the best way to do it. But it's one way of doing it to get the water in the pump, so to speak, to get things started. So as I've been doing it this half century, with the greatest profit, glory to God, thank you to God, I just want to give testimony about how, and I still to this day at my tender age of 72, I still make it a point nearly every night, gladly, not out of compunction, not out of compulsion. I find a spot when the sun is going down because praying the Our Father in the evening is very valuable because it sets you up for sleep and good dreams, <laughs> commune with God even in the night. And I just want to say how much it has held my life together doing it daily 
joyously, just with gusto and gladness. So we're going to work through these 10. Our Father, five points in Jeremiah 31. Nine. Give us an insight biblically when God is acting as our Father. And you'll notice that you cry out to God, we were saying. We dialogue with God. We interact with God. We interface. It goes beyond saying prayers. It goes beyond one posture of prayer or only thinking we have to do this or do that or kneel. Or you can be walking. You can be moving. You can be with a brother or sister, a best friend, a wife, a spouse. It just happens because we pray without ceasing. It's crying out to God. Yeah, that's, that's when God fathers us. The second one is, the Hebrew says, he carries us. God fathers us when you only see one pair of footprints in the sand. He's carrying us through the tribulations of life and the challenges of life. He delights in doing so as Father. The third one is he takes us through the waters of refreshment, causes us to walk by those waters. We get that drink of living water. That's when he's fathering us. No matter how dry the day and the situation is, he miraculously, amazingly, with dimension, does this with us. Trust him for that. He'll father you that way. He'll father me that way. The fourth one is he causes us to be upright, which means he takes the mistakes out of life so we don't keep repeating things that would slow us down or keep us from getting ready for heaven. And last one is that he keeps us from stumbling so we don't fall on our face. We don't trip over something and kaboom. Aren't those wonderful dimensions of fathering? So, the first affirmation, when he taught us to pray, in the model, the paradigm of prayer that we do regularly, and we pause at point number one and we say, yes, you're my father. I know you'll father me, such, in these, such as in these five ways. It goes beyond that. You know, you want to look like your father. You want to resemble your father, have a likeness of nature. And he transforms us every day more and more into his image. But point number one, the top ten, at the top of the top ten to get it started, we must affirm and embrace his warm, loving, personal Father, so you just stop and you go, yes. And you think about what that means in your life experience and walk. You find time to do this. This will take some minutes, huh? The second one is, who is in the heavens? Like a spiral. It's in the plural. In the original text, it's in the singular when it says, give us this day our daily bread just before that about how your, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Singular there. We'll, we'll explain the difference. But in the plural, one way it may mean is like in Jacob's golden ladder. It talks about rising higher. The Our Father reminds us we must always be progressing. We can't get mechanical. We can't get stilted. It's so vitally important that we grow in our moral preferences, that we grow in our personhood, our identity. We grow in our capacity for emotion. We grow in our capacity for imagination. Our capacity grows in our ability to give and receive love for our renewed mind to have dimension so that it's wider and longer and higher and deeper. Our Father who art in the heavens, he's inviting us up higher. He's going to buoy us up. He's going to pick us up. He's going to bring us staircase and stair and tier and level higher. It's a big, big yes for progress. And so when you're praying through this personal way, the model prayer, the disciples' prayer, I'm going to say, I'm going up the heavens. I'm not going to stay where I'm at. And I'm going to do it his way with his definitions. And life is going to be progressive and satisfying. I'm not going to be content with mechanicalism or standing still. 
I'm not going to be static. There's going to be a dynamism. You want to know what God would like to hear from you? Say yes to the heavens. That's a big thing, isn't it? Not to stay the same and be transformed and be in this dynamism, to be more like him, to be committed to that progress and that spiral up by the power of his spirit as we seek his face. Again, these are just little thoughts in each one. They're not necessarily the best thoughts or I'm not giving the only way or the best way. He'll develop that with you in your walk with him. It's supposed to be individualized that we all come through the same 10 yeses with our Father. The third one, hallowed be thy name. The third yes, the third affirmation. The third, I'm going to stop and pause and let this be real to me as an individual, as a, as a disciple in Christ. In the Bible, God only has one name. He has many titles like Elohim and Adonai, but he only has one name. It's Yahweh, which in Hebrew means I am. When Moses said, who should I say sent me? With old Ammon hoped up the second, that young whippersnapper Pharaoh that <laughs> wouldn't let the people go. Just tell him, I am sent you. Oof. Just tell him, I am sent you. Is, was, and will be. The one ever coming into manifestation. The personal God that births faith. His only name. Hallowed be thy name. That's the third one, isn't it? Now, when you hallow something, the Bible word here means, as you already know, to set apart, to make sacred, special, not ordinary. It's never ordinary, is it, walking with Yahweh? It's never, it's never. He makes the ordinary extraordinary. It's his nature, it's his power, it's his way, it's his commitment to us. And so what I'm going to do at number three is I'm not going to play life my way. I'm not going to work with my definitions. It's going to be his name, what it means. I'm going to be transformed and conformed to that image, and it's going to be special to me. I'm going to make joyous sacrifices. I'm going to give it all I got. I'm going to keep my nose in the book, the great word of God, the Holy Scriptures, the 66 books of the Bible. I'm going to be in there with my nose in the book. I'm going to be a diligent student like the Bereans in Acts 17 because I want to know what his name means. I'm going to make it special. I'm not going to fall into sin and injure him. Not going to get into compromises. He is special. That's number three. And you're going to stop again if you're sitting on your sofa or you're walking around. You can do it when you jog too, huh? If you're a jogger at night, go through the 10 yeses while you jog. Hold your wife's hand. Call a best friend on the phone. It's good to do it alone too. I usually do mine alone, but I always rejoice when I can do it with others. Our, our discovery team gets together sometime and you'll have two people that are praying through it and the first one will pray the first half, the first five, and the second one will give the six through ten yeses, switching around the next day. Sometimes I do one, your person does two, I do three, they do four, you go back, whatever, whichever way you want to do it. Sometimes just listen to someone and do all the time, be there with them. It's not mechanical. And it doesn't have to only be ten, there's other ways of diagramming this, but it does conveniently work this way, and 10 is God's good number for wholeness, but we've done three. Let's go to number four. Hell would be thy name. You already know it. I can hear you already. Thy kingdom come. Your kingdom come. When you pick up a concordance and go through the word kingdom, you'll see it's constantly associated with privilege. Step into your privilege. Negatively, 
don't live below your privilege. The kingdom is glorious. It's where the king has his way and reigns within the heart. This is a, this is a big number four, isn't it? Yahweh, who you've always been, I want it true right now. I want it the way I go to work. I want it the way that I maintain close relationships. I want it the way I live, the way I die. The way you reign as king. So, number five. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Number five. Your will be done. I'd like to expand how the original Greek text gives a little extra nuancing. It's not that our translations are not trustworthy, or they're not, they don't need to be corrected, they're not wrong, but I'd like to add some of the layers of meaning that the original text gives. You have two words for the will of God in the Bible. One is about circumstances, and he rules from the throne always in our, as we need to be prepared for him. He's always doing that gloriously. But the other one is his preferred will that you can turn down. It's, it's his best. It's his best offer. Are you going to, are you going to say yes to it? So this number five says that preferred will spiritually and gloriously, spiritually become physically into my life and around me. Even as it is in heaven. Wow. Let it be on earth. And heaven is in the singular, meaning the glory around the throne collectively, who he is. Wow, that's that's quite a mark, isn't it? That's quite <laughs> that's quite a number five to say yes to, to affirm. And again, we're stopping it with these when we're praying at home or we're jogging or we're praying with a friend. Will you consider adding this seriously? I know as a pastor for 30 years and I've been in ministry this half century. I don't run into many people who use this as a pattern of prayer. They will sincerely pray it from time to time. It's not like they don't know it or never pray it. I'm not criticizing that. But I don't, I think not many take advantage of this glorious opportunity to pray just what God wants to hear. Have you ever been in a relationship where you would like it or the person on the other end would tell you just what you want to feel and hear? Wouldn't that be grand? And here's God giving us the 10 that soothes his soul, so to speak, <laughs> delights him. So let your preferred will emerge into the physical realities of my life as it, as it is in heaven itself. That fullness, that fullness, let it be here on earth, the arena that I live in, where I work, where I live, and I'm going to do it enjoying your fellowship. And I'm going to do it making those promises that you drop in my heart to make gladly. I'm going to do it affirming that you do all things well. You make no mistakes. So that's number five. Now we're on the first half. We did the first half, which tends to be very vertical, you might say. The second half tends to be a little more, you might say, horizontal in human relationships. Number six. Number five, by the way, was go for the better and not just the good. Let's go beyond, beyond our borders to the glory of God by his power. Number six, give us this day our daily bread. You see that little graphic that we have up there? It's like a coat tree and you can hang your head on it and throw your coat on it. It's the apparatus, the apparatus of life. He sends things that are a blessing to us. It can be a special thing we enjoy eating or drinking can be that bread. A special friend, special music. Associations and opportunities, they come into our life every day and he delights in doing that. Give us this day our daily bread. And Lord, do it not halfway or minimally. Remember, we're stopping and 
We're doing this personally. We're not just saying prayers. We're interacting with God. We're interfacing with him so that his wishes become ours. Oh, to your delight. Now, bread works, number six, only when seven's present. That's the way the text reads. And indeed, only when number seven happens. That makes seven pretty important. <laughs> Give us our daily bread. I can hear you saying the rest of it. As you forgive our debts. Debts? We have debts. I thought Jesus forgave us at the cross. He did. John 19.30. It is finished. The true believer will never experience the penalty of sin. It's all been covered by the blood once and forever. That's the penalty of sin. But we all know there's a power of sin that goes along with things when we let down our guard and we experience the challenges of life. Things that hold us down, burden us, limit us, stifle us. Forgive us our debts. And the Greek word of FMA, forgive, means take it off and send it away. Are we okay with our debts being sent away? One person that struggled with smoking was asked by a fellow believer, don't you just want to be released from that nicotine? And the honest reply was, I hate the bondage, but I love the chains. But release us from these limiting things, these chains, these fetters. We have to pray it. We have to say yes. We have to affirm it. And this delights God. These are the ten delightful thoughts to God that he's faithful to perform. But it's got to be personal. we got to pause. It's a, pause. It's, a, it's a ponder point, a reflective moment. Ponder pause. Again, with someone, alone, while you're exercising, on the phone, whatever posture and place you find yourself in. Well, six bread happens because of seven, and the way the Greek runs, the original text, seven happens because of eight. As we have also forgiven our debtors. It's, it's really Bible. Simply put, people do the wrong thing to us, and they take away our opportunity for a full life in God and so forth, and they owe us. But we're told to release that. Now be punitive even though they have stolen from us or are indebted on a certain level. But if we don't forgive people, send it away, that desire to punish, then we make that person we haven't forgiven sit on the throne of God, and that's idolatry. That's why number eight, if we don't get the release from number seven, number eight, we have idols in our life. And they can be men, let's call those he-dolls instead of idols. They can be women, they can be called she-dolls. Whether she-dolls, he-dolls, or idols, they've got to be sent away when they're outside the will of God on a certain arrangement or place. We have to serve the Lord rather than man. The Holy Spirit will teach you what that means, but it's an important affirmation. Number nine, going into the last two. Number nine is often considered by theologians the most difficult one of the ten to interpret. And that's because the word that's used in the original text can either be translated temptation or test. And there's two kinds of tests in the Bible, positive and negative ones. I'll explain quickly. We know God doesn't tempt anyone. He never puts a worm on the hook and lures someone into sin, so it can't be temptation. So I submit that it's better translated test. Lead us not into test, but which kind? When Job had a positive test sent by God, you can't say, don't give me a positive test. God knows best. But Hebrews 12 says that when we stray from him, we get chastising tests. When we're, you know, we, we miss the mark and God's got to deal harshly with us. We need it. 
we're glad. But we want to avoid that. So this prayer basically says, number nine is, I don't want to live in a careless way where you have to deal roughly with me because I'm so insensitive, I'm so out of it, checked out. You have to deal strong with me. No. So we want that to be preventive. We want that to be <laughs> not a part of things. So the last one. The great climax. Can you hear it in the mind after that? At least it's not an invitation, but rather deliver us from evil. Christians need to be delivered? Well, the word is rescue. <laughs> we, we regularly need rescue. And the way the text runs is rescue me and lift me up, snatch me up on whatever would harm me, Take me off the path and draw me close to yourself for yourself. And it's deliver me, not from sin, but from evil. The Bible has a lot of words for evil, but this is the word for pain. The root meaning of this term is pain. Deliver us from pain? We get stalled by emotional pain and we linger in it. It drags us down, and God wants to lift us up from that, whether it be depressive things or deep disappointments that cause us to linger and linger on something that's hurt us or let us down. This is where God delivers us right to himself, the one that is full of light, who has the river of life, and he adjusts and puts us on the course the way he would have us. So the tenth and climaxing yes Rescue, deliver, snatch us up to yourself and for yourself and away from those debilitating, unnecessary things of the flesh that drag us down of the pains of life. So, on the closing thought, would you consider making this part of your prayer life? since it's the only prayer that I know of in the whole Bible we're commanded to pray. There are many wonderful prayers, but where everybody's commanded to pray it and to do it regularly, keep doing it as the says, keep on regularly doing it, our daily bread, perhaps even daily. Sui generis, French, one of a kind, this is it. I take that pretty seriously, huh? When you have only one model paradigm and all the Bible that condenses it into this rich, wonderful package so that we don't just stay on one idea, but we have the diversity and breadth. And so consider this very week. I'm just going to put in a personal element. I've been sharing this prayer and this teaching different countries and cities around the world. And I check back later and I ask what happens. And you know what I find? Unless a person does this in the very first week after hearing it, often with another person. They never do it, except maybe at a wedding or something, and they'll pray the Our Father once in a while and say it out loud. But as a form of meditation, that paradigm, that model prayer, the sustained meditation, something personal. So I'm going to challenge you. It's likely that if you don't do this today, tomorrow or the next day, I mean, you don't get right to it. And one way you can do it is we're going to leave something on the screen for you that is a review of this. You can print it out. You can use it on your phone. It's got a nice little summary. It's not the only way to do it. As I said, not necessarily the best way to do it, but it's one way to get started. Ask a friend. Give a call. Ask your spouse. Ask your best friend. Dial it in with a, if you're jogging around at night. Kneel by your bedside. These are all different ways, but it's not for Gary's sake. It's not to be impressive, is it? It's for Jesus' sake. Amen and amen. So tying things together, Galatians 5.25 does a great job of tying these things together because it unites prayer and faith in that passage. 
True prayer is where faith is birthed within the heart. We're going to interact with God, and he's going to tell us his wishes, what pleases him. So it says, walk in the Spirit. And the term, stoicheo, is that original term for stay in step with the Holy Spirit. And if I could illustrate it, sometimes God wants us to be very reflective and savor the moment. We take little steps, ponderously, meditatively. We're not in a rush. Smell the roses. Don't run pie. But there's another time when you got to take big steps like you intend to get there in cadence. Stay in step with the Spirit. The, the Our Father will give you light not only in the moment, but those yeses will stay in your spirit. An ideal time again to do it is in the evening. Why? When you go through Genesis, it's not morning and evening were the first day, morning and evening were the second day. It's always evening and morning because the day starts the night before in the Bible. Yeah. How you go to sleep matters. You remember in 1 Kings 3, Solomon went to sleep. And while he was sleeping, God asked him what he wanted and held him accountable for what he replied subconsciously while he was sleeping. You're still alive when you're sleeping. And if you want to enjoy sweeter sleep, better dreams, wake up with God's thoughts, it's especially refreshing and nice to go through these 10 yeses, these 10 affirmations, just before you go to sleep or when the sun goes down at sunset. These are great times. It'll help us to stay in step. The impact will remain with us. We'll have a sense and a better sense of when to go slow, when to go fast, take small steps, take large steps, and we can have that glorious walk with God. So let us pray to that end. Father, I want to give testimony that you have never failed me <laughs> in this sacred time of the Lord's Prayer he taught his disciples. You've held my life together with it. I look forward to it every day, every night. And so, however you lead the people to do it in the freedom and liberties that will go with their special schedules, where they're at in their capacities, you know just what to do, we know that. But we want to be disciples. We want to be learners. We want all ten yeses to be affirmative, yea and amen, in the way we prefer you, the way we take all of our identity in you, the way that we have all out, all in muchness in you and with our neighbor as you live your life through us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Uh, we would like to thank Dr. Gary Hill for that wonderful teaching that he shared with us. And I hope that you are all blessed. And today, friends, uh, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. And so I'd like to read once again 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and downwards. It says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was being betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So friends, uh, this is a memorial that is given to us believers in Christ, and that is why this is an exclusive celebration. Only those who understand and have welcomed and received the gift of salvation can participate in the Lord's Supper. The bread symbolizes the body of Christ, which became our substitute. He died in our place. We are the ones who are supposed to die on the cross because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But Jesus took us aside and he took our place. And the, the blood, I'm sorry, the, the wine symbolizes the blood of Jesus Christ. And the Bible is very clear. 
without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So all of the benefits of salvation we have received through Christ. Salvation is all by God. It is all by grace. It is all by faith. And even the faith and the repentance that you and I had when we accepted the Lord, even that came from the Lord. So there is really no boasting. Salvation is not by good works. It is all the work of God. And if you understand that, if you have received that, if you have welcomed that, if you have made Jesus the Lord, the Savior and the King of your life, then you can partake of the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you that we could remember your goodness, your redemption, your grace. And Lord, we are grateful to you. And Lord, as we remember what you have done, as we partake of these elements, allow us, Lord, to reminisce all the good and wonderful things you have done for us, albeit as you went through suffering, pain, even death. Thank you, dear Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us partake of the bread and the wine, please. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, once again, we are grateful for this memorial, this ordinance, which reminds us, Lord, that salvation is all by God, all by grace, all by faith. Thank you, Lord. And may the glory be yours and yours alone. In Jesus' name, amen. So, friends, um, We'll see each other again next week. But again, don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube, YouTube channel and our Facebook page. And also, please don't forget that we are on Light TV every Saturday, 6.30 p.m. We are also on FEBC stations all over the nation. In DZAS, we come out every Sunday at 9.30 to 10 p.m. God bless you all. Here are our announcements. We now have two kinds of services. We will still have our virtual services for a majority of our members through our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu, International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph, and our YouTube channel to view our services. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Good news, brothers and sisters. Our radio program will now be heard nationwide through FEBC radio stations. As an added bonus, all Living Word original songs will likewise be aired as well. So, if you would like to listen to our radio program, we're coming out in the following stations. 702 DZAS AM, broadcasting from Pasig, every Sunday, 11 AM to 11.30 in the morning. We're also coming out from 104.3 DWAY FM from Legaspi. This is also every Sunday from 10 to 10.30 in the morning. And for those of you in Tacloban, we're coming out from 97.5 DYFE FM every Monday from 11.30 in the morning to 12 p.m. For those of you in Zamboanga, we are coming out from our station in 1116 DXAS AM every Sunday from 11.30 to 12 p.m. Also, for those of you in Davao, 
We're coming out from 1197 DXFE AM every Sunday from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 2.30 p.m. For those of you in Coronadal, we're also coming out from Station 1062 DXKI AM every Saturday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you in Cagayan de Oro, we're coming out from 103.3 DXJL FM every Sunday from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And for those of you from Metro Cebu, we're coming out from 98.7 DYFR FM every Saturday and Sunday from 8 to 9 p.m. Please tell your friends about this and tune in to our radio program. Let us pray that God might use this radio program to become a blessing to as many people as possible. God bless you all. Great news everyone, we already have three weekend services. Every Saturday at 9 a.m. for the Sabana service and two services on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the English services. We'd also like to thank our partners, our members who have been consistently giving to partner with us in the work of the Lord. We'd like to share our giving channels to those who would like to partner with us in the work of the Lord. You can deposit your love offerings to the following banks. Banco de Oro. Account name is LWCCCII. The account number is 001-0000060800. We also have a BPI account. Account name is Living Word Christian Ministries, Cebu Incorporated. Account number is 10210234811. Finally, we have RCBC. Account name is LWCCCII. Account number is 1452005286. To give via GCash, just follow these simple steps. From your GCash app, click Bank Transfer. In Bank Transfer, click the BDO icon under Select Partner Banks. Enter the amount. Enter the name LWCCCII and account number 001-0000060800 and send the receipt to office at livingword.ph Then click Send Money. You may also send your love offerings and donations online through our website. Go to www.livingword.ph and click Give and then a dialog box comes out of it. Kindly click on your giving preferences. Thank you and God bless.